thank you so much for having this conversation with us today. Um, we are really very privileged um, to really hear your thoughts as well for our audience uh, at TEDxNTU. So, you know, you're part of the co-founding team at AWARE and also um, a member of the Singapore Council of Women's Organization, uh, one of the founders of TWC2 as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I think your accolades are just endless, you know. But um, maybe we can start with uh, a really a burning question in your last couple of years, uh, decades of uh, being a journalist and being uh, working with AWARE. Uh, what are the stories historically that has happened? Um, when anger was a trigger. Yes, with, and anger was a trigger and yeah. it led to something positive. Yeah, I, and I, I think it's important that we get angry or that we get stirred by something. Mm -hmm. So let me let me tell you about two other um, accounts which I'm, uh, uh, situations which I'm familiar with. Uh, the first is back in 1950s. Okay, it was really the first wave of the women's movement in Singapore. Uh, this lady, Shirin Fosder, she was really middle-aged by then. She was uh, born in India and as a to a progressive family and as a schoolgirl, she really started making speeches and working about women's rights and social issues. Anyway, in 1950, she and her husband came to Singapore to spread their Baha'i faith. Okay? Uh, that was why they came here. And, and they started mingling, getting to know people. And after time, she realized that the people, the men she was meeting at the social events, who, and who she presumed they were there with their one and only wife. Mm -hmm. But she discovered that no, it was the second or third or fourth or fifth wife or mistress or concubine or whatever. In other words, she, she, it was polygamy because there was no laws and marriages didn't have to be registered in those days. And she was horrified that, that there was so much polygamy and so little legal protection for women and children. Uh, whether you were a, a, a Chinese or a Malay Muslim, you know, you could have many wives and you could just discard them and walk away from them and not provide for them. So in 1951, she decided, um, this, this really annoyed her, you know, so she decided something needed to be done. And she got together at her home, 20 or 30 of the leading women in Singapore. They were leading various organizations and welfare organizations and so on. It was really a cross section. There were uh, colonial white women, um, Indian, Chinese, Malays and so on. And they formed the Singapore Council of Women. Mm. Uh, it included people like the war heroine Elizabeth Choi. Yeah. You know? um, so throughout the 50s, the Singapore Council of Women, led by Shirin, or, or you know, pushed by Shirin, um, did all manner of campaigns to, to get the uh, political and community leaders to pay attention to the need to ban polygamy. You know, they organized talks and, and wrote letters to the press. Uh, they wrote an open letter to the uh, David Marshall when he was chief minister in 1950s. Um, and um, uh, it didn't get very far, you know, because there were all these barriers. People, the British authorities would write back and say, look, marriage is governed by the, uh, the, the Chinese customary law or something, you know, and we can't do much about it. But their calls resonated with the People's Action Party, which was then in opposition. Mm -hmm. And within the People's Action Party, there were women like Chan Choi Seong, who um, joined the party when she was very young. And she was also really a passionate believer in women's rights and um, pushed from within the party. Uh, significantly, in 19, 1959, voting had been made compulsory for people and women had the vote. So women, the, the female vote was an important uh, target for the PAP. You know, it was 50-50. So in their manifesto, they they actually talked about women's rights and, you know, uh, equal pay for equal work, protection of women, widows and children, uh, uh, even wanting to get more women to politics. Mm. And um, of course, when the PAP came into power, they started delivering on their promise to women started uh, working on what would be eventually become the law as the Women's Charter in 1961. Mm -hmm. So there's one case where the anger of Shirin Fosder led her to stir other women into doing something about it. Mm -hmm. The other case was uh, around 2002. In, I think it was 2001, an Indonesian um, lady who was working here as a domestic worker died because of the abuse she, she suffered at the hands of her employer. 
when the case um, uh, came to the courts and there was media coverage, the I think it was the Straits Times talked to a neighbor, mm -hmm. uh, a man who said he, he'd been aware of what was going on, but he did nothing because it's none of my business. Mm -hmm. okay. And of course, the reports about this, how this woman was so badly treated and starved, got many, many people angry. But it was that comment of that neighbour which added to the anger. Okay. And um, it was four women, aware women actually, who were sitting, having tea and, and talking about things and they talked about this. And they were so angry about the fact that this could happen, that a woman could die this way. They said, we have to do something about it. And so they organised a meeting and a whole bunch of us uh, turned up and uh, for a, a couple of years we functioned as a non-registered society and actually had meetings with uh, Ministry of Manpower and various other government officials because we had as a de facto leader uh, Bremer Mati who was then a nominated member of parliament and after two years uh, we decided we should register TW, uh, uh, the organization we called it TWC2 which is Transient Workers Count 2 Mm. And so TWC2 has been around um, for, what, I think, 17 years now and uh, doing a lot of important work in uh, catering to the needs, looking after the welfare of migrant workers, not just maids, but mm. all foreign workers in Singapore, uh, particularly during the recent the, or the current um, pandemic um, and having all our, so many of our foreign worker, all our foreign worker dormitories under lockdown and uh, mm -hmm. you know providing them with top-ups for their um, mobile uh, SIM cards and so on. Mm. So, so these, yeah, these yeah. are all examples of how anger, exactly, together with deliberate action and yeah. So these were people, ordinary citizens, who saw something that was going on around them or something that was not going around them, and got angry. You know, it, 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 it's not boiling red anger. It is really this a recognition that this is wrong, mm. that this shouldn't be happening, that we need to do something about it. And then sitting and talking and saying, so what can we do about it? Yeah, I like how you stressed on it's not just pure anger, that um, it's mindless, but more like, I want to do something about this. Yeah, it's, this is not right. Exactly, it's considered anger. I mean, my, the point is you need to feel that anger or that strong emotion. It could be sadness, it could be, you could call it concern, mm. uh, however you want to call it. I say anger because it's easy to recognize it. This is wrong and this must stop, yes. right? And then, but having said that, what else? Uh, and, and this is where the, the challenge is to, to do something about it. From um, being, you know, um, just just uh, observing on the sidelines to deciding that, okay, let's do this. Yeah. Right. So would you say how um, that's how activists I, today I, have uh, been? I, I think it's a... I, I see some young people today who want to be activists, you know, um, who are... The, the, who see a whole range of issues that they feel uh, need attention. And then it's a matter of, now, which one should I get into? How best, you know? Um, and I suppose it's not easy. I mean, if, if you have a strong feeling in, about a certain topic and there are existing organisations, you know, AWARE and, and, other, and many others now, it's easier, you can join and volunteer. But if it's in a new area, like a few years ago when, when climate change started becoming an issue, um, there aren't really, there weren't that many organisations uh, actively uh, working in those areas, other than perhaps the Nature Society. But so what is great is we've seen mostly young people coming out, come out with things like SG Climate Rally and, mm -hmm. and, and various others. Um, I don't know. I think we'd have to ask them whether they are born as activists <laughs> or whether it's something you yeah. grow into. I, I don't know, maybe you know, there's also this uh, <clears throat> general perspective that uh, if you're into activism, which means that you, know, you need to be standing against um, political leadership, you know, um, there's this image of how activism is like, uh, do you think... Troublemakers. Yeah, troublemakers yeah. even. That's... Yeah, so what are your thoughts on that? Is that That's true? That's sad. No, it's sad that that perception mm. exists in Singapore. And um, I mean, to a certain extent, if you are an activist or an advocate, it's because you see policies or situations which you think are wrong and which you would like, like to see corrected. And with policies, obviously, there are people who made those policies. And if they, uh, if, if they see you attacking their policies and saying it's not good enough and or it's wrong, 
there is a natural tendency to get defensive. Right? Mm -hmm. I would have to resist the temptation to get angry if you were critical of what AWARE is doing. Right? It's, it's just human, so we have to recognize that. But I think um, I would like to see policymakers and political leaders uh, not look at advocates and activists, you know, uh, uh, people who are critical um, or may come across as critical of existing policies, not to see them as troublemakers, but as people who, uh, citizens who share, who have strong views about what's going on and who have views, um, who would like to share their views and who would like to contribute to, to conversations that lead to greater clarity and perhaps to changes that would benefit Singapore as a whole. Mm -hmm. you know? Uh, we, we suffer too much in Singapore from this mentality that if you're not with us, you're against us. Um, which in this day and age is, is wrong. You know, we've, we've got to, we've, we've done incredible work as a nation in ensuring that we have our, that we, our, we have, uh, we live in harmonious multi-culturalism multi and so on, right? Um, let's, the diversity that we have in Singapore. Let's cherish this even more, mm -hmm. you know, and learn to live with even greater diversity, uh, diversity of views. So even activists um, themselves need to be able to see from different perspectives. Oh yeah. Not just, you know, getting uh, political leaders or corporates to see it from their perspective, but um, I think it's it's an open conversation that all... Yeah, and all it's a conversation you need to be able to have in different languages. I don't mean languages, yeah. but, you know, you have to phrase your message in language appropriate to the audience, right? I mean, if it means talking in Singlish or talking in dialect, yes. but it's, it's not just the actual language, it is the concepts you put across. How do you convince an auntie or uncle who've been doing things a certain way to start looking at things differently? That's another facet of activism. It's Absolutely. about um, you know, having the art of language yep. to connect and convince and persuade, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, public education is a very important part of a lot of what activists want to do. Once you decide to get into active, to do something, basically, you know, you, you to 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 turn your your emotion into action, then you have to decide now how do I do it. I don't have to necessarily form an organization. I, I as an individual, um, you can take action. You can see your MP. Mm -hmm. I don't mean on little personal issues, but I try and get their attention on big issues. I regularly tell people, just write to your MP about any issue. You know, whether your MP is interested or not, that's not the, the point. The thing is, you see something wrong about Singapore, um, formulate your argument, put it down in writing, send it to your MP, because your MP is your elected representative in Parliament, which is the highest policy-making body in Singapore. And whether or not your MP raises it in Parliament, they should know about it. Mm -hmm. And they should know how people on the ground are feeling. So the individual citizen can be an activist and should be an activist. Do something about the issues. Um, but it is, of course, much more effective if you find like-minded people, they either join an existing organization or you form your own organization mm -hmm. um, because you've got more minds, more hands, you know, more experiences to share. Mm -hmm. And more research to back your argument. Exactly. Up. More people to, yeah. to, to undertake different projects. That <laughs> yeah. But you know, when you mentioned about individuals, um, now with social media getting more and more accessible, mm -hmm. right, we see uh, more individuals stepping up, raising uh, their opinions. Yeah. And it's kind of leading to public outrage uh, as we will see on social yeah, media. Some of you it know, is misplaced how outrage. Do you think, yeah, how do you think this outrage it actually influences yeah, I think the work of activists? Yeah, it can give us a bad name, uh, give us a worse name than we have <laughs> because we don't really need it. No, no. The, the thing is, social media can be a great um, leveler. I mean, mm. it's so accessible, right? So it can be very useful because it allows us to to get past traditional media, which may be hampered by various considerations, it allows you, uh, gives you an avenue to get directly to people. But it's an avenue that can be so easily abused, right? And so when it goes to extremes, what we need to avoid, and we unfortunately do see it, uh, too much of it in, in, in not just Singapore, many places, but let's just talk about Singapore. It's, you don't want to get, you don't want people to become vigilantes. 
Mm -hmm. And so when you get into this doxing thing, you know, when yeah. somebody, when people are rightfully upset about something or another, whether it's some hit and run car or something more major, and then they start digging and coming out with details about the people and publicly trying to shame them, that is dangerous, right? Um, that is not considered action. Are we just driving um, anger that's mindless or um, do we want to get people that are listening to us or like followers or your community or networks to want to do something mm. together with you that's also different? Yeah, exactly. And it's it's getting people together to do what? Mm. You know? If it <laughs> yeah. is to join in shaming or, or, or attacking somebody and potentially causing major disruptions to their lives, which may not be justified, then obviously that this is the vigilantism that you must avoid, right? Um, there's this rather bad habit in Singapore of people getting offended and then making police reports. Um, I, th I think it's useful that we have a mechanism where citizens can make a police report, but we need to educate our people so that they use it more effectively and not because you just decide you get offended and it becomes a way to bully people and to attack people. Um, it can become a barrier to what we need to do, which is to learn to have fuller and franker conversations. The difficult conversations. The difficult conversations between ourselves or with policymakers, with people in the other camps. We need to create an environment, conditions conducive to having difficult conversations, where we can express our concerns about blatant racism or, or sexism or ageism. Um, and cultured in language so that people can begin to understand, you know, why why you feel that way and why, um, you know, this whole thing of Chinese privilege because the Chinese are the majority. You you may be completely unaware of the impact that your words and actions are having on people in minority mm -hmm. groups. I think um, this really ties in very closely uh, to our audience because the theme for TEDx NTU this year is a world reimagined. You know, and uh, from the last half an hour sharing, um, you have walked us through 35 years of um, activism work here in Singapore, especially um, in the field of gender and beyond. Yeah. So, um, you know, my question, my last question to you would be, uh, what do you think is uh, the role we imagine in the field of activism? And I think you, you shared a bit about, you know, yeah. what your hopes of um, how Singapore can become uh, in the future. So this question, like, yeah. how would you imagine well, the, the, the biggest wish, yes. okay, that, that, uh, that, that if the world, if we could just make this world come about right now, and there are hopeful signs, is really that we work, get away from this kiasu mentality of Singapore that ends up with us having such a thin skin and so defensive and close and protective of our, our corners, our comfort zones. You know, the signal has to come from the top, I think. Um, the uh, political leadership, uh, policy makers, you know, they, they need to signal uh, more clearly that they understand that diversity is useful and welcomed, that this should include a diversity of views. We, we, we need to see them move away from this tendency to take the view that if you're not with us, then you must be against us, you know, and to understand that when, you know, this, I think Tommy Cole used the term loving critics, that, that, the, that you, we need to encourage these loving critics to express their points of view so that, and, and so that we can have these honest and open conversations. But in order to do that, all of us have to learn to sit there and listen to criticism and not to get defensive or to curb the natural <laughs> tendency to get defensive, you know, and not to see it as an attack on you personally, but as a valid point of view that you want to try and understand, you know, and so that you can put across your point of view. And, and hopefully somewhere you can find some middle ground, some, um, if necessary, compromises, or even walk away agreeing to disagree, but with a new understanding of why that person feels that way. Mm -hmm. You know, is that too much?
to, to I think it's like simple to say that is you know uh, we should all agree to disagree but um, it's a hard thing oh yeah as a community for yeah. us to recognize that and, and come to that consensus and to be fair the activists themselves need to learn that the activists themselves yeah you, say. you know I, I said earlier right that we at aware um, need to be ready to except that others may disagree violently with what we are saying and doing, <laughs> right? And if they're critical of us, how do we deal with it? So, so we should welcome, whether it's from within or without, you know, and, and within a way, we do have sort of intergenerational differences in points of view on something, like cultural appropriation or misappropriation. I mean, these are all big things now, right? And um, when these things come up, you can find sometimes it's a generational thing to say, why are the millennials feeling this way? And <laughs> why are you all boomers or whatever feeling that way? So, but we, we should encourage the expression of these views mm -hmm. and find ways, even within ourselves, to have the discussions without, without putting ourselves in that situation of dealing with criticism. Um, we won't know how to, in, internally, I mean, we won't know how to deal with it externally. Mm -hmm. So essentially you're saying, um, the world reimagined starts at home. Right? Oh, yeah. Before you can reimagine oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. how the political. Oh, yeah. Leadership. And that's an important point about activism, you know, that even before you uh, go and get involved in something or get an organization, you need to ask yourself okay, whatever it is I'm trying to argue, mm -hmm. gender equality, climate change, save the animals, whatever, can I convince my mother, father, siblings, auntie, uncle, grand aunt, you know, neighbors? Okay, because if you. You can be an ambassador for change in your self, right? With the in your circles, in your with your work colleagues. Can you? You know? And if you can't if you don't see the importance of beginning to do that in your own private mm -hmm. circles, how are you gonna be effective on the larger scale? Because it, it's just that the, the challenges are magnified. You know, it can be difficult to talk to your parents or grandparents Definitely. about certain <laughs> issues. So how do you do it? So we, we should start practicing at home first. Absolutely. On convincing our grandparents about gender equality yeah, before yeah. going out on social yeah. media. And people have succeeded, you know. But, but, those, but if you get that practice in your personal life, it should give you uh, skills, ideas about how to do it on the bigger scale. You know? mm -hmm. So do it. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. That, that's been really wonderful. Thank you for sharing all these. Thank you for having I, me. I, I yeah. feel like it's it's almost like a movie that's played out <laughs> about the whole history of how far, um, you know, how far um, we've come when it comes to activism or um, women's rights. Um, and I think it gives me hope as well about, mm. uh, you know, all these stories when we pass on to the future generations and what yeah. um, they can create um, together with um, the rest of Singapore. Yeah. yeah so. Thank you so much. Not at all. Thank you.